so I want to welcome everybody here. Our last meeting of the school calendar year, our first meeting of our uh, local summit fiscal year. Um, so we welcome also some new board members who are here today as well. Last week in the news, we saw pictures of dead fish and dead turtles, if you remember, that had washed up on the shore of Long Island Sound, only to discover that their death was caused by lack of oxygen in the water. And then they went on to say that the lack of oxygen was because of fertilizers, pesticides, and stuff that had runoff that had come into the water. And that is really the topic of our meeting today, to talk about what is that stuff that we use on our lawns, um, in our communities, that could be the runoff that does this dastardly deed in, our, in Long Island Sound. And it may affect not only Long Island Sound, but our children uh, in our very communities. So before I go any further with this, uh, I'm going to hand the program over to John. We're going to dispense with our tidbits today because we have... Oh, uh, because we have such a full, rich program. I'm sorry. <laughs> Jeff has promised us a quiz, though, in the fall. So try to remember all those tidbits that he shared with us during the year so that you will be on point on the fall. In the meantime, I'm going to turn the program over to John Bradley. Do I have enough cord? Yeah. Uh, good morning. Uh, can everyone hear me? It's my privilege to introduce our panel for today's program, Healthy Yards and Healthy Children. We are blessed to have four individuals who understand the science behind lawn care products, their impact on our health and the health of our children, and alternative ways of, and means of creating lawns and fields without the hazards born of chemical fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides. Our first speaker today will be Dr. Diane Lewis, who is the founder of the nonprofit organization, The Great Healthy Yard Project, and author of the book by the same name. It was Dr. <laughs> hazards. It was Dr. Lewis's book that inspired today's program. A nephrologist and a consultant in environmental health, Dr. Lewis comes to us this morning from Bedford, New York, where she serves on the town of Bedford Planning Board and as a board member of the not-for-profit Bedford 2020, in addition to other posts and duties. Dr. Lewis is also a freelance reporter writing on matters related to health and the environment for the New York Times, the Cleveland Plain Dealer, the Baltimore Sun, and other papers and periodicals. Joining Dr. Lewis will be Patricia Patty Wood, who is founder and executive director of Grassroots Environmental Education, a not-for-profit organization that uses science-driven arguments for clean air, clean water, and a safe food supply. Patty Wood is the co-creator of the award-winning Grassroots Healthy Lawn Program, which has fueled the growth of the organic lawn industry. She is the author of The, Safe, the, the Child Safe School and the co-producer of the documentary film Our Children at Risk, which explores the scientific research linking environmental toxins to children's health problems. Joining Dr. Lewis and Ms. Wood will be Westchester County Legislator Catherine Parker and Town of Omerneck Supervisor Nancy Seligson. Catherine Parker represents the seventh legislative district, which includes Mamaroneck, Rye, Larchmont, and parts of Harrison and New Rochelle. Legislator Parker is a confessed environmentalist and supporter of Dr. Lewis's Great Healthy Yard Pledge, and has introduced a range of legislation to protect the Westchester County environment. Before becoming a county legislator, Catherine Parker was instrumental in the passage of a leaf blower ban and a ban on plastic bags, among other environmental initiatives in her home community of Rye, New York. Nancy Seligson was elected supervisor of the town of Amaranek in, in November of 2011. 
As town supervisor, she serves as a trustee of the Westchester Joint Water Works and the Larchmont Mamaroneck Joint Garbage Commission. Nancy has spent much of her career in environmental advocacy and has been at the forefront of the decades-long battle to save Long Island Sound. She is past president and current board member of the not-for-profit organization Save the Sound, and she is past chair of the Westchester County Environmental Management Council. Our four panelists know the heartbreak of finding a dandelion rooted in the soil of an otherwise perfectly green lawn. <laughs> but they also know the price to be paid for the chemical warfare waged against that dandelion under those yellow warning tags that dot our streets and avenues. Ladies and gentlemen, our first speaker, Dr. Diane Lewis. Thank you, John. Um, I must say first that I really don't find dandelions quite so objectionable. <laughs> um, you know, early in the springtime, dandelions and clover are one of the first things um, that butterflies and bees can rely on before our native plants have bloomed. So they're actually an important source of nectar. And in my book, I have recipes if you're not putting chemicals on your lawn. Dandelion, I, they're, the recipes are given to me by a friend who um, is a really well-known cookbook author and um, has a strong Italian heritage. And they are well-loved and well-used in many countries and actually quite expensive in our natural markets here. So here's a plug for dandelions. <laughs> um, well, it's, it's good that we're doing this this week. You know, just in March, the World Health Organization came out with a statement saying that glyphosate, which is a commonly used herbicide, you know, um, weed killer, is um, a probable carcinogen. And just this past Sunday, um, the nation of France banned its sale in garden centers for residential use. So everybody is making strides, and this is becoming more and more understood. And here in Westchester, we have a really educated, interested population. But people work really hard for their homes and want them to look really nice. I think what we really need to do is change the aesthetic and educate people. And we're at a tipping point. This will be. I think at this point, a really doable thing to get people to change the way they're taking care of their yards. Um, I began my work on these issues with Bedford 2020, which is a group in Bedford, um, a nonprofit that was formed to enact the town's um, climate action plan and act as a liaison between town residents and town officials. Um, I'm chair of the Water and Land Use Task Force. And in that capacity, as I was working on the projects for 2020, I realized that not just in Bedford, but nationally, and really everywhere, the most widespread source of contamination in our drinking water are these chemicals that we use very casually on our yards and gardens or flush down our drains. And how easy is it to fix that? This, how many times in your life is there something so important that's so easy to fix? So the Great Healthy Yard Project is a really easy way for groups to work together and decrease non-point source pollution, phosphorus, nitrogen, that cause eutrophication, and um, also pollutants that can lead to harmful health um, effects. Each year, Americans use 80 million pounds of pesticides, and these don't just stay on our lawns and gardens. They wash with the rainwater into our streams, lakes, and rivers, or absorbed into our deep groundwater aquifers. And in fact, these are the sources of our, of our drinking water. So people think of just turning on the taps, but that water comes from somewhere. And we're polluting that water, and water treatment does not remove all of these chemicals. Um, new information shows that very small amounts of these chemicals, in fact, have serious long-term health consequences. 
and it's partly a matter of scale. There are more, so we have new information, but there are also so many more of us than when these chemicals came onto the market. They came onto the market in, um, after World War II, and they were thought to be godsends. They saved you know, countless GIs from malaria, and um, while they are not continuing to increase food production, the fertilizers did help us win the war by increasing food production at that time. But now there's so many more of us putting so many more chemicals on so many more yards, and it all adds up. 80,000 chemicals have entered the market since World War II, and homeowners use up to 10 times more chemicals per acre than farmers do. So the Clean Water Act went a long way to protecting us from industrial pollution in our waterways. But it, it didn't address very effectively household chemicals that are put on the yards and put down the drains. And now, in fact, while there are serious issues in isolated places, this is the most widespread source of pollution of our drinking water. So where do these chemicals go when we put them in our yards? As I mentioned, they wash into our water sources, our streams, lakes, and rivers. And as I mentioned in my article in the New York Times, tests show that these chemicals are, in fact, in these waterways. So the EPA did tests that were released in 2013 that showed that more than half of the water nationwide and up to 70 percent here in the Northeast and also the Midwest had enough fertilizer to be deemed of poor quality to support life. I mean, that's just, still, again, this is so easy to change. And as I said, homeowners are really responsible for a big portion of this. In our area, homeowners are responsible for, um, and small business owners and so forth, for almost all of it. Um, the U.S. Geologic Survey tested streams nationwide and found that almost every stream, lake, and river had at least one pesticide and often more. And while the amounts were very, very small, these chemicals act together. They act cumulatively and are, in fact, a serious problem. So you can do everything that you think is right in your household. You can avoid BPA in, in your you know, children's water bottles. You can even buy organic food. But if we're putting these chemicals into our drinking water, we're, we're going to suffer the health consequences. So in, <laughs> did I miss something? Yes, I it's okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, uh oh. <laughs> I think that'll take more work than moving orange juice <laughs> on my part. <laughs> okay, so um, Rachel Carson began talking about the effects of chemicals that we are using as pesticides in 1962, and her book Silent Spring awakened everybody to the problem. But now we know that these chemicals are affecting people, too. In 2009 was the first time that the Endocrine Society, which was a group of um, both physicians and researchers in the field of hormones, released a position paper detailing the links between these sorts of chemicals and diseases caused by the disruption of endocrines, the endocrine system. Now, this was based on 485 peer-reviewed journals. And it's a big deal. They don't often publish position papers. But this is a turning point. Um, so bear with me. As John mentioned, I'm a doctor. I'm going to get geeky, but just for one minute, OK? What do you think of when you think of hormones? Women. <laughs> <laughs> Women, sex, adolescence, right. teenagers. But hormones do so much, not just sex and puberty and, and reproduction. Hormones control almost every system in our bodies. They control development and weight metabolism in addition to those things, um, and neurologic development in babies. So normally, we all sort of know that hormones are secreted by a gland and travel through the blood, bind to an organ, and cause an effect. So think of estrogen going through the blood, binding to breast tissue, and it grows, right? We all get that. These chemicals in tiny, tiny amounts that we couldn't even measure the amounts of them 10 years ago actually either act like extra hormone or bind to these receptors and prevent the normal hormone for, from acting. And that causes a massive disrupt, disruption 
in the way our body functions. So um, unlike carcinogens, things that cause cancer that act by damaging DNA, this is not dose dependent. The more of a cancer causing chemical, the worse it is. These things cause a problem at a very, very small amount. And all the things that act like, say, estrogen act together. And all the things that act like thyroid hormone act together. So really, really tiny, almost immeasurable amounts can make a huge long-term difference. And the time of, of exposure is what's most important. So if children are exposed when they're young or a mother when she's pregnant, that causes huge, huge life-term consequences. But it's an issue for all of us. Um, and we need to, and many pesticides that we are using, almost all of them, are in fact endocrine disrupting chemicals. We've seen what are probably the consequences of this, and we really need to care about this because children that were born in the 70s were the first um, group of children to experience higher, to be exposed to these chemicals from, you know, gestation through adulthood. Um, and these people that are now adults have had an increased incidence of infertility. About 12% of women are expected to get breast cancer. 16% of men are expected to get prostate cancer. And the incidence of both of these, you know, diseases are caused by disrupting the, uh, are increased by disrupting the hormones related to sex. Now, it's not the only cause for this, but we know as a fact that it increases the incidence. We can reproduce this in laboratory animals, and we can look at it statistically in the population. We don't need to be using these chemicals. We do know that we can, ADHD now affects 10% of kids. Almost 2 million people are affected by autism. And both of these are increased in incidence by being exposed to thyroid hormone, thyroid in, in gestation or childhood. Thyroid hormone affects neurologic, determines neurologic development in the newborn and in gestation. And we've known that for a long time. So women that are deficient in thyroid hormone and had big goiters had children that had very diminished IQs, and that's why salt was iodinized to help the thyroid work. We've known that it affects the neurologic system. We didn't know exactly how, but we can now reproduce these problems with thyroid hormone disruption in the laboratory. Again, it's not the only cause, um, but it, it's definitely a contributing factor that we don't need to throw in the mix. One in three Americans are expected to have diabetes by 2050, and we know that incidence is increased by, the by disrupting the hormones of metabolism. We know that um, farm workers that work with pesticides, we've known since the 1980s that they have an increased incidence of diabetes. Again, this is just a huge problem. The World Health Organization, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, in March just came out and said that um, the um, that pesticides were related, that glyphosate was related to cancer, to non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and to other cancers. Um, the World Health Organization also did a study that showed how much it cost Europe um, to deal with the health consequences of these hormone-disrupting chemicals, and it was in the billions every year. And we can expect that it's about the same here. So we would save money, save people a lot of heartache if we change what we're doing. Um, the government, as I mentioned in my article in the New York Times, the government had proposed changes for agricultural workers um, to protect them because they know that the chemicals that they use commonly and that we are using um, on our yards and gardens lead to an in increased incidence of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, prostate cancer, Parkinson's disease, and lung cancer. We don't need these chemicals to make grass look artificially greener. And when you think about what it does, it's not attractive. We shouldn't, it's, it's not a matter of even finding other ways to chase that aesthetic. It's done with it. This is not pretty. That's an outdated aesthetic. Um, those chemicals will be there even after the water's treated. 
and it's a huge issue as you know everybody's been reading about droughts and 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 problems you know where people are going to be drinking treated water there are many things we can get out these chemicals do not come out entirely with filtration they're in after the best filtration and water treatment they are still in small amounts in the drinking water um, but yet the solution is so simple it's a matter of changing the aesthetic and getting our friends and neighbors to work together. We all share our drinking water. So if I don't use them on my yard, but my neighbor is using them and they're washing into the drinking water, I'm still going to be affected. We all need to work together. And it's a really great way to get to know your friends and neighbors. <laughs> well, but it is. I mean, it's really worked that way in Bedford. In Bedford, so far, we have 4,400 acres pledged. And, um, and, and people are having coffees to talk with their neighbors in a nice way about this issue. Um, the, the book and, and the handouts that we have um, for the Great Healthy Yard Project really are a way, in an meant to be really attractive way, to open this dialogue. Um, and I've been working with Catherine Parker, as John mentioned. Um, the towns of Bedford and Pound Ridge, and now the county of Westchester, has adopted a resolution. And, and, and Catherine led that to um, promote everybody trying to take the pledge. And the pledge is to take care of your yards without synthetic pesticides, weed killers, or fertilizers, except on rare occasions to improve habitat for native plants or wildlife, and not to throw pharmaceuticals down the drain. I don't know about Larchmond or Mamaroneck, but Bedford's police department has a um, drug drop-off where 20, okay, and Larchmont does too. So there's there's no need, 20, you know, 24 hours a day, you can drop off your drugs, they don't have to go down. There are, oh, it's not 24 hours? No, we don't have it. Oh, well, actually, if you go to the DEA website for, um, and you can go to my website if you want to, the tghyp.com, there's a link. They can, they'll show you which um, police stations nationwide have it. There are many in Westchester. There's also the um, hazardous material take back at Valhalla. So there are really easy, good ways to drop off these pharmaceuticals. The DEA is really concerned both about water quality and, and misuse of drugs. So it's a really great program um, that's getting bigger every day. But um, we can have really, really beautiful yards with native plants that help pollinators without any of these. We can work together. In northern Westchester, our water affects the um, New York City reservoirs, which you guys drink from down here. And here, your runoff and your water affects the Long Island Sound, which we all recreate in, play in, and we eat the fish from it. So we really can work together um, and do this together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I had, a, I had a, a very easy ride up here this morning from Port Washington. Uh, I'm, usually I'm, I'm stuck on the Throgneck Bridge, but today it was just a, a straight shoot. Um, okay, just a little news update. Um, as you probably heard, um, we had um, some major fish kills um, because, of, uh, because of a lack of oxygen in the water, which was primarily caused by nitrogen loading. Um, nitrogen uh, that winds up in our waterways um, typically comes from human waste. This is the number one reason for nitrogen loading, and secondarily from fertilizer use. Um, right now, um, because of our situation uh, where we had this fish kill in, within the last two weeks, and then again on Sunday night, there's another major fish kill in the Peconic Bay area, which is, um, which is uh, out uh, off the North Fork of Long Island. Um, we're going to continue to see this. I'm sure you have seen it uh, at various times. Um, when you have a sewage uh, sewer system, you're in much better shape, but where you have individual homes that have septic systems and cesspools, that's where we run into trouble, uh, especially those homes that are on um, bodies of water. Um, that nitrogen easily um, filters through the soil and into the water 
And um, we are trying to address this. Um, one of the ways that we're trying to address this on Long Island, um, our organization is working with the Nassau County government right now and will um, also work with Suffolk to reduce the nitrogen level in, in commercial fertilizers, which are used by not only homeowners but also by landscaping companies, um, to a number, a nitrogen number, at 11 or 11% 11 or below. 11% means that 11% of that bag of fertilizer, the weight of that bag is nitrogen. And a typical fertilizer that you could find, like from the Scotts company, would be somewhere upwards of 33 or more. Um, so we're really, that would, this would be a tremendous decrease and would help us um, tremendously to lower the amount of nitrogen in, um, in fertilizer. Speaking of that, anyway, I mean, we really don't need it. It's not particularly healthy for your, for your grass uh, because what happens when you just give it that high shot of nitrogen early in the spring, everything jumps up, it grows really fast, you have a lot of top growth, very little root growth, everything turns bright green, and we say, ah, oh, doesn't our lawn look beautiful? But in fact, um, as Dr. Lewis was saying, we need to actually have a different thought about, you know, what, you know, what's healthy and what's not when we look out at our lawns. You can actually have beautiful green lawns that are basically weed-free without using any high, you know, high nitrogen fertilizers or pesticides. Um, another thing, in case some of you don't know what glyphosate is, um, which Dr. Lewis was talking about, it's Roundup. And Roundup is the most commonly used weed killer. We, everyone's out there with their little nozzles, you know, thinking that they're, uh, you know, that they're going to, you know, just take care of those really dangerous dandelions. Um, and, and that they're gonna, their property is going to look better than their neighbors. This is like ridiculous advertising. But kudos to France for saying, you know, this is unacceptable. And, you know, it'll be a long time before we ban its sale uh, in the United States. But those of you now who know that it has a link to non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, um, you, um, you might choose not to use that product. Um, OK, so I'm going to talk a little bit about children um, because this is one of the focuses of grassroots environmental education. We educate the public about the links between common environmental exposures and human health. And one of those common environmental exposures is pesticides, um, both used on turf and inside um, buildings, uh, your homes, schools, institutions, and so on. Um, so one of the things that we do is we work um, with legislators. Uh, in New York State, um, we actually have a law. Uh, it is called uh, the Child Safe Playing Fields Act. Um, our organization was instrumental in, uh, in writing this law and getting it passed. Um, it actually prohibits the use of pesticides on turf at all schools in New York State, K through 12, um, public, private, parochial, including daycare and pre-Ks. We are the only state in the United States that has this law. Um, Connecticut was actually the first one to step into this, and they have a law that protects children K through eight, um, and it is challenged every single year by the industry. And so two years ago, because we work also in Hartford, um, we put together this digest of independent science on children's um, health issues that are related to pesticide use. And this is the kind of um, work that we do at Grassroots. So we are all about peer-reviewed academic research uh, because the science really is critical um, to all of these environmental health issues. Um, so anyway, uh, we're working in Connecticut. We were able in this last session to actually preserve what we have, which is a K through eight bill. Um, and it was challenged all over the place. The industry really wants to go back to an IPM program. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, integrated pest management. Um, it is appropriate um, from our perspective for indoor use, um, but totally inappropriate for the use, um, for, um, for using um, pesticides on turf. Um, an IPM program, Integrated Pesticide Management, was the original name for that program. It was created by the industry, and they are always behind these programs because this is a program that says that you have to use the least toxic 
um, remedy first, but that you always have the opportunity to use a pesticide if that least toxic remedy fails. And so it is really, and it's not just you can only use um, least toxic pesticides, but you can use any pesticide um, in an IPM program. So um, we, discourage, we discourage IPM programs, especially in schools, always, um, because we never have any control over who is administering that program. Um, so um, just very briefly, the reason that we, that we focus so heavily on children is because children are uniquely vulnerable to environmental toxins because of their size, because of their developing bodies. They have undeveloped immune system detoxification, elimination systems, um, and they don't have the enzymes uh, that adults have that may help to break down some of these toxins. And also, pound for pound, they take in more toxins found in air, water, food, and the environment than an adult does. Uh, and because they have different behaviors. If there is a three or four year old in this room right now, they might have already gotten tired of sitting on a chair. And so they would be sitting on the floor or they would be digging through their mom's pocketbook to find something that they would then find its way at some point into their mouth. So they have that typical hand to mouth behavior. They play close to the ground, not only indoors, but also outside. Um, so pesticides from our perspective as an organization that not only works on um, the links between these, um, these toxins and human health issues, um, but we also train landscapers and homeowners in how to do it without toxic pesticides um, and still have what you're looking for, which is a beautiful lawn and landscape and something you can be proud of and not be embarrassed of um, you know, in your neighborhood. So I'm just gonna go through very, very briefly, starting in early spring, which has already passed, but probably the first thing that happened is that your landscaper came and did a spring cleanup. And then they put down lime. And then they put down a weed and feed product, which was your typical high nitrogen, commercial, water-soluble fertilizer, which means that as soon as it rained, it was off your property, down the street, into storm drains and into surface waters, and some of it actually percolated down into your groundwater. So that's what happened. That weed and feed product, the weed part is, um, is typically 2,4-D. This is a phenoxy herbicide. Um, this is the same type of herbicide um, as 2,4-5-T. Uh, and in combination with 2,4-D, those two chemicals made up Agent Orange which was used during the Vietnam War and which our Vietnam vets are now suing the government for their own cancers and their children's birth defects. Now I'm a visiting scholar at Adelphi University. I teach in the School of Nursing and Public Health um, and I teach a lot of RNs who come back for recertification and it is amazing. They, they, are, they are at the age where they are the, the adult children of Vietnam vets. And almost every single class that I teach, somebody will raise their hand and said, my dad, you know, has a, you know, such and such cancer, either a leukemia, a lymphoma, or, uh, you know, those are the two very typical ones that you would get, but many other cancers as well. And some of them also had birth defects as children um, that, um, that they were assuming were, um, were associated with their father's exposure during the Vietnam War. So if people knew that, you typically wouldn't say, yeah, go ahead, put that chemical on my lawn where my children are gonna play. But people don't know. They just sign their contract with their landscaping company, says, yeah, I'll take, you know, I'll do this program. There are nine applications, and that first one is that weed and feed. And then they put down the lime. Now, why do they put down the lime if they haven't done a soil test yet? So number one, if you go to the doctor and you're not feeling well, or you wanna just know how how healthy you are, and you want to know your levels, your cholesterol, and so on, you would have a blood test before you took a drug, correct? But we don't do that with our lawns. We don't do a soil test to see whether it needs anything or not, or see what amendments it's, um, you know, it's deficient in um, before just going ahead and having these companies come and just make all their applications on every single lawn in our neighborhood does without knowing what they need. And so a soil test is essential. You get that soil test, it, take, it, it looks at the, the basic macronutrients, um, nitrogen, um, uh, the uh, blah, 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 magnesium, not magnesium, phosphorus and, what am I looking for? 
Potassium, exactly. Potassium and phosphorus. Yes? No, phosphorus, potassium, in that, in that order. It's nitrogen, phosphorus, and, and potassium. Um, and then it looks also at micronutrients, and it will look for if we are very, if we are, it will look for pH levels, which would determine whether or not your lawn needs lime. It will also look at the amount of organic matter. If you have, if you have zero organic matter, your lawn is in trouble. It means that that soil is not healthy. And if you don't have a healthy soil, you can't feed a plant. That plant really depends on healthy soil for its nutrients. And so what's really important is that you, when you have a soil test done on your property, that you have a comprehensive soil test done so that you really know what should be done to make that soil healthy. If you've already been using pesticides and you've decided not to, you want to make sure that instead of putting down that weed and feed product, that they are going ahead and they are putting down at least a half an inch right, right at the very beginning of the season of compost, really good quality compost. Um, and there's a little bit of a learning curve here. You should probably try to find a landscaper that has experience in organic turf maintenance, organic yard maintenance, and they are, they are actually blossoming, growing in Westchester County. At one point, Westchester County had more organic landscaping companies than any other county in the United States. So you really do have options here, and that's a, that's a very positive thing, so look for that. You can actually go onto our website, which is grassrootsinfo.org, and find a list of landscapers in various parts of the county that have taken our Grassroots Healthy Lawn training program. Okay, so when you get your soil test back, they can add lime if your pH, you know, um, requires it, uh, the pH analysis, um, and then they would start immediately putting in, um, in some soil um, food, and soil food is basically compost, in the form of the compost or compost tea. Um, compaction is turf grass's worst enemy. If you have little kids and they spend a lot of time on your lawn, you are compacting that soil. Roots grow in the air spaces in soil. When you compact it, there are no air pockets. And so you want to make sure that you're relieving that compaction. Now, when you aerate a property with either slice aeration or core aeration, it's actually, you know, it's, um, it's stressful for the grass. So you don't want to do it unless you have to do it. Um, but if you have a lot of compaction or if you're, you know, if you've just done construction, um, or you know any kind of renovations on your home, you've had a lot of heavy equipment on your property as well as people walking on it, you might want to at that point do a, a very um, comprehensive aeration and then overseeding. Um, the best time to seed is in the fall, but you can seed again early in the spring. Your first mowing of the spring should be the only mowing where you actually collect the grass clippings and throw them away. And that's because you want to just make sure that you're removing any blade diseases that might have occurred over the winter months. And so you actually cut it pretty low, and then you actually collect the grass clippings. For the rest of the year, you leave the grass clippings on the lawn. As they break down, they provide nitrogen, natural nitrogen. You're actually fertilizing your lawn every single time you mow it by leaving those grass clippings on the lawn. Um, okay, so I talked about compost and compost tea, very important. Um, if your soil is really toxic, if you've had a lot of chemicals on it, um, I talked about the half inch of, of uh, compost, but you can also use marine products such as kelp and seaweed, um, which contain minerals and add organic matter to the soil. When you mow, you should only cut at two and a half to three inches. Those blades should always be pretty high so that you can take advantage of the photosynthesis process, which is so important to any plant. Um, organic fertilizers, just a quick mention, organic fertilizers are always water insoluble, which means that they do not run off your property when it rains, that they, they stay in the soil and they literally just make themselves available as the plant needs them. So that's what, that's what you absolutely want to do if you do nothing else, stop using water soluble high nitrogen fertilizers. That will be a huge improvement. Um, irrigation. 
don't water in the evening. Don't water between 10 o'clock and 4 o'clock, where you're just, everything is just going to evaporate. So you're just wasting water, wasting your time. Water early in the morning. It is the only time that's valuable and that really does something positive for the plant. Okay, when you water at night, it stays wet, or you water late in the day, it stays wet all evening, and then you have a higher probability of, turf, of fungal turf grass diseases. Um, I can talk about overseeding really quickly. Even if you have the most beautiful lawn in your neighborhood, you should always overseed it every single fall between the end of August and the end of September. You always want new grass plants growing in turf. And by the way, if you have a very dense turf, you're not going to have a weed problem. And if you do have the bare spots, which is where you get your weed problems, you should always have a bucket in your garage that's filled with a combination of compost and grass seed. And wherever you have a bare spot, you just put down the compost and grass seed. The compost will keep it moist, and it'll keep the birds from just, just picking it all up off the property. And you can just constantly keep seeding those bare spots. Um, we have a lot of information over on this first table right here. Ellen Weiniger, who is our Westchester County wonderful person, um, has brought lots of information. Um, it's our green card. Uh, it is a, a card for our pets and pesticides. Very important that we keep our dogs off lawns. Um, there is a, a much higher incidence today since we have started using pesticides in our communities of canine lymphoma, which is the which is the um, the dogs. Um, counterpart to human um, non-Hodgkins. And we have our green card, which on one side is Pesticides 101, and the other side is a complete organic lawn care program. So please take this information. Thanks so much. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I was... Um, I, I've gotten to know Dr. Lewis over the last couple of years, and I have to say that I was extremely impressed by the Great Healthy Yard project that she had started with Bedford 2020. And it really seemed to me that to take that program and really use it as an educational initiative for Westchester County would be a great start uh, to really help see our water quality improved. We, after all, have six major watersheds in Westchester County, as well as reservoirs and streams and lakes, and it's really one of the things that we value about uh, Westchester County. Uh, I introduced a resolution which was passed unanimously this spring to, uh, in fact, start the educational initiative. So I passed out today uh, you should all have a copy of this, The Great Healthy Yard Project. And I do hope that you will sign that and add your name to the list of Westchester County residents that understand the connection between what we put on our yards and what ends up getting into our water sources. Uh, it's interesting, I've been going door to door and actually um, talking to neighbors and uh, talking to them about about what they're putting on their, their yards. And I usually get a response like this, oh yeah, I don't do any, any I don't put anything on, on my yards. Uh, my landscaper takes care of that. <laughs> and, and you know, in truth, Westchester County is number two in the state for use of pesticides and fertilizers. And number one is actually, I believe, out in Long Island. So here we're talking about the health, we will be talking about the health of Long Island Sound, and it's surrounded by communities that are really putting a lot of things on their, on their yards that are obviously getting into our water sources. Um, the initiative, uh, and the, the resolution, uh, I just want to read one part of it. It's an educational tool both for the county to educate residents and for residents to educate their neighbors who share their watershed. And I really you know, would ask that we can all um, really take it upon ourselves to have the conversation. I, uh, just this, over this past weekend, I met with a resident who again, you know, hadn't really thought about, uh, you know, the consequence of what goes on their lawns. And I was talking about sort of the health ramifications. You heard Dr. Lewis talk about the hormone disruptors. And it's not just for humans, but also for animal life. And it was really interesting because this couple, as, as I was talking to them, they said, you know, we used to see a lot of toads on our property. We haven't seen toads in years. 
And I, I immediately knew, well, there's a connection here. And it also made me think of, by the way, call out to, uh, to Elizabeth Colbert's book, The Sixth Extinction. So uh, I really thought, you know, wow, that's connecting the dots, right? So uh, anyway, I will, I will also just, uh, I'll be brief because I think you've gotten some tremendous information again from Dr. Lewis and, and Patty Woods. Uh, we did put on our card the importance of disposing of your um, pharmaceuticals in a proper way, and we do have the number on the card for the Valhalla Recycling Center, and uh, I would certainly ask that that, that um, goes hand in hand with this. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I've been waiting about 25 years to have this discussion in this forum, so I'm very glad for that. Um, the, I've been working with the Long Island Sound Study for a very long time, and pesticides and fertilizers have been a major concern for the Long Island Sound Study for the health of Long Island Sound for that long. I have to say right away that my lawn is a detoxed lawn, and it looks pretty good. I mean, you're all welcome to come, 7 Douglas Lane. It's not perfect. It's not Kentucky bluegrass. Every blade is not perfect. But you know what? It's green, and I have toads. I have toads that visit my yard. So I'm very proud of that. Um, and I had to, it took a long time to convince my landscaper not to do anything. I actually don't let him do anything except mow the lawn. But he's used to it now. <laughs> so I'm OK. Um, as we've heard, pesticides and fertilizers can be very harmful to um, people, pets, and to waterways. And um, what is so upsetting in the waterways is that we don't really understand runoff in our communities. And what happens is if you put too much fertilizer on your property or if you use pesticides and it rains, Whatever has not been absorbed by that lawn is going to go right into the nearest catch basin, which is the grate you see in your street. It's connected to a storm drain, and it's going to go right into the nearest river, stream, or directly to Long Island Sound, depending on where you live. And it doesn't get treated. It doesn't get treated at all. So it's going straight into the water just as it is. One of the number one problems in Long Island Sound, and I don't know if you all have seen the Long Island Sound report card that was dropped uh, two weeks ago, um, but it, it get, it's a report card on the major stem of the sound. So it doesn't go into Mamaroneck Harbor. They did do two harbors, Hempstead Harbor and Norwalk Harbor, but not ours. But our area, which is the Eastern Narrows, has a D plus grade, an overall D plus grade. Now, that doesn't mean that it's unhealthy for people to swim or recreate in it. It means that it's a D plus grade actually in terms of the ecosystem services. And one of the problems is we have very low dissolved oxygen. So when that fertilizer goes into the water system, fertilizer is growing plants on your land. That's what it's supposed to do. And guess what? It does the same thing in water. It grows plants. We don't want plants growing in our water that aren't supposed to be there. We would love to have eel grass, that long, beautiful grass that you see, which actually does an amazing job of protecting us from flooding and uh, cleans water. But having an overabundance of nitrogen in the water, which is nutrification, um, causes hypoxia, which is low dissolved oxygen. And that's because it goes in the water and it grows plants. And those plants give off oxygen when they're growing during the daylight, but as they decompose, their decomposition process actually uses oxygen and they settle through the water column. They end up on the bottom and a lot of that oxygen is removed at the bottom of the water. So if you're a fish and you're thinking, mm, this oxygen does not feel good, I'm getting out of here, you leave. But if you're a slow moving lobster or if you're a non moving shellfish or other creatures that really can't leave, they suffer and they can die. So that's why we have very reduced lobsters in the Western Sound. One of the reasons, I mean, there's a lot of reasons of problems uh, with water temperature as well, because we're at the very southern tip of what the lobster habitat is. And any change in water temperature really, really changes the game for them. So I walk around my neighborhood, 
and you know, I represent my neighborhood, <laughs> and I go crazy because I see those little are uh, yellow tags on everyone's lawns. And I know that they're also using fertilizer. Those are just for pesticides. And I want to talk to people about it. I want them to recognize that if they have little kids, if we have pets. I mean, I used to say that, you know, when my son was old enough to read, he'll know not to go on that lawn. But my dog is never going to learn how to read. <laughs> and she's not going to know not to go on those lawns. And that really is upsetting to me. So it is possible to not use fertilizer. It is possible to not use pesticides, and it makes a great difference. The Long Island Sound study has been trying to work with counties because the legislation to ban um, pesticides or change the use of fertilizers has to be done on a county level in New York. We can't do it. I can't legislate that in the town of Mamaroneck as much as I'd like to. But in Suffolk County, they have moved along, and in Westchester County, to prevent nitrogen fertilizers from being used in the winter. That makes sense, because the ground is hard. It has no use for fertilizer at all. And people were putting fertilizer on even in the winter. So that's a start. But we need to really educate people. And I'm hoping that your great information and the Healthy Lawns Project really can bring it to a new level for people. Because just as these endocrine disruptors affect people, they affect marine life also. We see some funky things happening in Long Island Sound. We know that the pharmaceuticals are also hurting. And that's why we just held three drug take back days in the town of Mamaroneck. And I have to say, some of the staff were like, oh, you know, what's that going to do? Well, we collected over 80 pounds of unwanted pharmaceuticals, which is a lot. And we're hoping that we can do this on an annual basis so that people, although there are other places to bring them, that you know that you can just collect them for several months and you'll be able to dispose of them properly in your town. Now, you don't have to dispose of them this way, but you don't want to put them down the toilet or the sink. That's the number one problem, because that's how they get directly into the water system. Um, we need to really work in the town of Mamaroneck to help encourage and sponsor this Healthy Yard project. We currently um, don't use pesticides, I've been told, <laughs> um, in the town of Mamaroneck. And we use fertilizer very sparingly um, because we recognize those issues. But I would like to have a written policy in the town of Mamaroneck that we adopt in a formal um, town board meeting so that we know exactly and we can share with everyone exactly what our policies are. And that's one of the goals of our sustainability collaborative, which is our environment committee. We have eight goals and that's one of them is to um, make sure that we reduce pesticides and, and fertilizer use and have a policy. So I'm going to push for that. But in the meantime, um, I really think that it is great to sign the pledge. I think that we need to have the conversation with our neighbors. I know it's not an easy conversation. I mean, even with my own dad, who thinks that every single blade of grass has to be perfect, somehow that's, he's, his identity is involved in that. And I think a lot of us feel that way in Westchester, that you know your front yard has to look the best. But you know what? It can look the best and feel healthy. I've already changed my aesthetic. You know, some people don't agree with it. But um, it is true that once you recognize what the cost is for having that perfect manicured look, that it doesn't look that good anymore. It looks toxic. It looks like it's causing harm. And that's what we really need to change. So I would love it if everyone took the pledge uh, and also talked to their neighbors um, we are going to be working on a, a policy in the town of Mamaroneck. And remember that what you put on your yard, on your street, on your roof, on your house, affects Long Island Sound. And it's going to affect it fast. And I uh, encourage everyone to take a look at this report card. It's really informative. It's not perfect. But it does give you a good idea of some of the effects of what we do. And on the back, it says how you can help. And um, 
basically number two is eliminate or reduce fertilizer and pesticides. And that really is the number one thing, I think, for residents that we can do for water quality in our community. Thanks. Thanks, John. Uh, I understand we have, we have, time, we have time for questions. Uh, and I would ask, if you have questions, if you would stand and, and ask them uh, clearly so everyone can hear them. And then um, if there's any doubt about it, if the um, person to whom the question is directed would repeat the question, that would probably help as well. So uh, the man in the green hat. <laughs> Hi, uh, how y'all doing? Uh, Jim Kalor with Habitat. It's an honor to have you here. I grew up where our landscape was where teenagers, I, I don't know what you're <laughs> So it, I commend you all, and it would be, would be a great thing if maybe you sponsored a breakfast for landscapers, if you want me to help you do that. I'd be happy to have you. I'd be honored to do that with you, Captain. Yeah, so, but the, you know, so one, one thing is, um, uh, we see California the way it is, and again, it's kind of like, People say, oh, solar panels look ugly. Well, you, you tell me asphalt shingles look, look, look nice, huh? Um, you know, think about that, right? Uh, California has brown lawns everywhere. We're a drought away here. And it's almost like I want to take it to a different different level because we're so concerned about, and it is Westchester, and, uh, uh, but uh, green, green and brown is not bad, too, with Tom Clark. But we're, we're not far off from that where we had to boil water in New Rochelle, Bronxville, and Tucko with United Water, which is a company in France that owns our water. So these are interesting times, right? And uh, two, two other kind of questions. One, are, would, would you be, would, is, uh, could you legislate these, these pesticides out of landscaping use? Second, there's a movement for growing food instead of lawns, which sounds horrible, but the price of food, I know this is a different economic community in a way, but uh, growing food on the front lawns instead of vegetable gardens. In World War II, 20 million people had victory gardens, and people had less cancer. And then the, other, the third thing with that is, there was a lawsuit in the county that I just found out about, about rain downs. I don't know if you heard about it, but there's free rain barrels that in Larchmont is one of those communities that people can get free rain barrels under that lawsuit. I don't know if you can bring that back to the committee, but someone was shaking their head over here. Um, and it, so um, that's a, first of all, let me start by thanking you. Is rain barrel water healthy to drink? Yeah, no. <laughs> but I, I also... What's healthier? I first want to thank you for the wonderful suggestion of meeting with the landscape industry because I think you're 100% right. That's a piece of this issue, most certainly. I will tell you from a couple of conversations I've had with landscapers, they feel tremendous pressure to provide great, beautiful lawns for their clients. So it's kind of a conversation that really does have to happen as well with the homeowner, which is right, why right, I am offering to, if anybody would like me to, to accompany them on a walk through their neighborhood, I would be happy to do that. Because I really think it is a conversation that is neighbor to neighbor, door to door. And I really think that it's important to, and we're starting with an educational initiative. So to your last point about can you legislate, yes, we can legislate. But I really think that there's so many important components to why this is just, it's more about the, the look of their lawn and it's making the connection for them to the health of our communities, to our water, and, uh, and for both you know, people and, and animals and our beautiful Long Island Sound for those that live in the Sound Shore community. So I, I think all your points are excellent, really great suggestions. I think again, I will make the last, uh, the, the last offer. Please reach out to me and I will uh, bring a bunch of these and we'll go door to door and we will talk about uh, the Great Healthy Yard Project and why it's so important that everybody gets on board with this. And then I think the landscapers will also hear back from, uh, because most people in this area 
don't take care of their own lawns. But I know in neighborhoods like in Shore Acres in the Maranek, the whole homeowners association, SAPOA, they have an organic landscaping company that actually contracts with the entire association. And I really think that for those of us that live in neighborhoods where we, we have a community association, this may be a great way to get started. Uh, I, I forgot to add that we actually are in the town of Ameranek working with two neighborhood associations to see if we can um, create a healthy yard uh, movement in that and, and have them be sort of model communities, model neighborhoods. And that would be an incredible way to showcase how it can be done and, and really model the good behavior. I just wanted to say that uh, in New York State we have a preemption law about regulating pesticides so that individual communities, counties, and so on may not regulate or ban the use of pesticides. But you can, as a, as a county or as a community, not use pesticides on your own town properties or county properties, and you can encourage residents to, uh, you know, to do the same through educational opportunities. And I think that this grassroots way of doing this is literally the only way to do it. And then you can go to Albany and you can say, hey, look what we're doing. We need, a, we need to be able to, we need to be allowed to, to regulate this. This did happen in Canada and it went up the, it went up the chain from the you know, provincial court to the Supreme Court and finally the Supreme Court said, okay, individual towns and communities in, in, in uh, Canada can actually ban the use of pesticides on residential properties. And I think a lot of the people that are working on lawns that do these maintenance, um, lawn maintenance programs are beginning to understand that they are perhaps the most effective because they're directly in contact and would be happy on the one hand not to do it. On the other hand, for a lot of them, it's a real source of income. It's a line item number that they can bill for. So as a homeowner, if you can explain to them, look, here are the other things that you can do for me to make up for that. I need some organic, I need some, um, I need my, to have my lawn overseeded to outcompete weeds. I need to have it aerated because it's compacted in clay-like soil. And I want to put in some native plants in areas that I have lawns. Can you do that for me? That's a great way for them to make back money. They are not going to do this if someone's not going to pay for it. If the homeowner is not going to pay for these chemicals, the chemicals are expensive, they're not going to be on your lawn. So it really rests on the homeowners, and it's wonderful to work with the landscapers, because the landscapers can then offer alternatives to the homeowners, and it will help protect the landscapers, too. Uh, Nancy, do you know the status of our golf clubs, too? The golf courses are watershed properties, Bonnie Breyer and uh, Hampshire. Yeah. But when you take all of the maybe five or six or seven golf courses in a row, that's a lot of land and a lot of grass. Uh, yes. and, and I don't know, Jeff, what their uh, status is in, using, in the use of these products, but that is also something that I would like to reach out to them about because we do have good working relationships with them. Good morning. We're also concerned about our energy usage and climate change and, and all of these burning issues, but what we often forget is that these products, uh, pesticides and synthetic fertilizers, are made from petroleum. So one of the first steps you can take in energy efficiency and conservation is to eliminate these petroleum-based products from your repertoire of things that you do in your own home. And it's a simple change that you can make. You don't need to wait for someone else to make that change or for the political will for that change. So that's really important and keep that in mind as you're doing home en energy audits and putting up solar panels. This is a simple one, but it has a very profound impact. Yes. 
Yeah, we, we have a model contract. We also have a letter to homeowners um, that, you know, that actually a letter from homeowners to their landscaper that they can send to them, a model contract that they can attach to that. Um, you know, we've tried to make it as easy as possible, um, but you, the, the one problem is that you have to educate the landscaper. They have to know how to do it because you don't necessarily have to have a lawn that's full of weeds and, and you know, bare spots and, you know, not doing well. Um, you can have a beautiful, beautiful organic lawn. Uh, it just, I mean, we, we, can, we can give you, you know, hundreds of examples of beautiful organic properties that look every bit as good as a synthetic toxic grass property. Uh, yes, you have a question. I, I actually have two questions. Um, first of all, is there such a thing as a safer pesticide if you're dealing with something like uh, uh, termites or termites or carpenter ants or something like that where you really have to do something about it in your next year? So what do you do about that? And the second question, totally unrelated, is, um, is, is, is our town or the village of Larchmont considering um, banning grass? Uh, in fact, like some of the towns that do have grass comparison, or has there been grass to be put to encourage people then to be on grass? Would you mind repeating the question, please? Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of times you're saving money and increasing the organic matter by encouraging people to help in their way. So, in addition to the uh, you gotta use the microphone. Microphone. It's a two-phase thing. If you have, as well as it, as far as carpenter ants, if you if they're nesting away from your home in the woods and you want to get rid of them, ants to some extent when they're not near your house are a good thing. But um, you know, ants like on peonies are meant to be there. <laughs> ants in the garden, not so bad. Ants near your house are a problem. If they're ants not near your house that for some reason you need to kill, um, red ants, whatever. Um, Spinosad and Orange Guard together are both certified for organic farming and we'll take care of it. But that just, you can look on my website or you can email me, um, but, but it's easy to do. It'll even work on fire ants. But neither of those will bring bait back to the um, nest. So if your house is threatened, you have to rethink that. And then you need to speak with your um, professional about the least toxic things that will actually bring bait back to the nest. That's a different thing than what you're using in your yard. And those and it can be very localized and you have to be very careful about how you're using it. Uh, I'll just say that we are um, trying to promote mulching leaves on everyone's property. We haven't um, stopped picking up the grass clip clippings or organics because they're combined with other organic material. It's not just grass clippings. But it is something that we can start to promote as well. Yes, um, just quickly, the Greenberg Nature Center in Scarsdale has done a training with landscapers about the mulching in place. So they have experience with bringing landscapers together on these types of issues. If um, anyone's interested in pursuing that, they might be good people to reach out to. One last question. This is really short. Are your model contracts, are they educational materials available for players? Yes. <laughs> we all we also have um, we also have cards that are in English and Spanish for workers. Many of the workers are not trained to handle pesticides safely, um, as far as protecting themselves. And so we have in Spanish how to protect yourself on the job and then how to protect your family when you go home by not putting your clothing that's contaminated into like the washing machine with your infant, you know, daughter's, um, you know, pajamas or whatever. I mean, we're very concerned about them not knowing how toxic these materials are that they work with and not being trained at all in many circumstances. Well, I guess we're, the meetings, uh, we're at a close. Um, I'm sure you'll join me in thanking our panelists for an extraordinary I have a copy in my hand of the Great Healthy Yard Project by Dr. Diane Lewis.
I'm happy to report it's in the Westchester Library System, and the Larchmont Public Library has its own copy. So uh, I would encourage you to take a look at it. Um, again, thank you all for coming out. Uh, and uh, here we go uh, in celebration with Nandalon. <laughs>